Good afternoon. Welcome to Common Talk. I'm your host, Jay Jack, here on intellectualradio.com. It's always our goal here at Common Talk to bring you some information, bring you a different take on certain things, certain situations, and we always try to educate, as we do in all of our programming on intellectualradio.com. So today we're going to try to educate and try to inform you and give you some information. I have here with me today Penelope Thomas. Ms. Thomas is a dialysis technician, and we're just going to jump in. How you doing, Ms. Thomas? I'm doing well, J. Jack. How about yourself? I'm good. Thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Let's, let's just start off. What is a dialysis tech? A dialysis technician is um, a person who administers dialysis treatment to those who are on, who have kidney failure, chronic kidney failure. Chronic kidney failure. That means their kidneys are no longer functioning as they should, or they're totally gone. They are no longer functioning as they should. And some of them, they are totally gone. So is that considered renal failure? Is that, that is correct. Total renal failure. Total renal failure. Yes. Okay. And so the dialysis is something that aids them to do the things that the kidneys don't do. That is correct. Okay. So kind of explain to us, what, what exactly is dialysis? Dialysis is a treatment. Uh, it uses, um, I'm sorry, an artificial kidney. And to an filter. artificial kidney. Yes, wow. it's an artificial kidney that filters all the uh, the is it like impurities, impurities and things? and things that the kidney normally does when it's functioning properly. So it, it takes it's like a, a filter that actually takes the gook out of the the blood system and it takes cleans all circulation. the toxins oh, out really? of the the kidney. It cleans all the toxins out. But when you have chronic kidney failure, it can no longer function properly. So you are now on dialysis. So we use an artificial kidney to take those toxins, remove those toxins and waste and fluids off of the body. Okay. That the kidney, because okay. the kidney is not functioning properly. Okay. Walk us through that, that procedure. Now we've all, <clears throat> pardon me, we've all heard of dialysis and we've in some instances may have seen the process of seeing that big machine and see that thing going around and they're plugged in and it goes through and I guess kind of, filters out and then sends the blood back into the body. Is that correct? But walk us through that whole process so that so our, our audience can kind of understand what that process is like. That uh, what you said was ex ex absolutely correct. When the uh, patient becomes, uh, when a patient has chronic, they are given an access. Uh, you have a, a catheter, or arm uh, arm access, which is a fistula that okay. connects your veins and your arteries together. Oh, okay. And they that's that's where the entry point of the process is started. Yes, there are two entry points. When you are first diagnosed with chronic kidney failure, your first access is a CVC, which, which is a catheter that's inserted in your in your neck in your neck yes okay. or your chest to remove the toxins so that your body can get uh used to being to having the dialysis treatment oh so you have to have the toxins removed prior to the, the dialysis treatment beginning yes they have to insert that that catheter so that you can begin the process okay and how long That's of the a, beginning uh, of the process? How long a procedure is that be between the time you get the catheter inserted and the actual process starts? It can be anywhere from six to eight weeks. Okay. That you have to start off because they want to see how you how well you're doing on the treatment with the treatment, the okay. dialysis treatment. And the so the patient will come into the unit and they would get weighed because you have to weigh them to see how much fluid they have on them because during the time when they're not on dialysis in between their treatment time, it's, like a fluid they build put, up. it's a fluid build up and they have to watch those fluids. So they, what is, what is the fluid that, cause I, I've heard that mentioned so many times that folks have fluid build up or they, they have excess water weight or whatever. What is, 
the actual fluid that's building up on them. If you can kind of break it down for us uh, non-scientific people. <laughs> the fluid buildup, it's them drinking too much water in between treatments. Okay. So it's water? It's water. It's water weight. Okay. And then because a lot of dialysis patients cannot urinate anymore. Oh, really? They they can't urinate and they their system can't be clean because their kidneys are totally they have totally failed. Then you have dialysis patients that can urinate, however, their their toxins cannot no longer be cleaned out of their system okay. because they're so, so you have two types. You have the type that is so severe that they're not capable of, of urinating or eliminating on their own. And then you have the types that can urinate, but they are not, the body is not uh, eliminating the toxins. Correct. It's is there a different filter. type of treatment for either or it's kind of the same treatment? It's the same treatment. It's just wow. that those that can, can, that can eliminate, mm -hmm. they, they don't have as much fluid build up okay. because they can go. But the ones that cannot, they have more chances of fluid building up because they can't, they can't go on their own. Oh, okay. So going back to the procedure. So you've been diagnosed, you go through the process of the filtering out or what, uh, detoxing yourself to get prepared for the actual dialysis treatment itself. So I'm sitting in the chair. I've gone through eight weeks of past. I come in for my first treatment or to start the process. What do they do? What does a technician do in order to start that process or even continue that process? Well, the technician will meet them at the scale so that they can weigh. To oh, they see have to be weighed. They prior? have to be weighed because they have something that we call in dialysis a dry weight, an estimated dry weight. Okay. That that means that's the weight. That's their normal weight before they have fluids on them. Oh, okay. So we want to make sure and see because some people put on weight and some people don't put on okay. weight. So you always want to weigh them so that you can know how much fluid to remove off of them oh, during that treatment. So there's a so process of seeing how much fluid is, is safe or for lack of a better word, that appropriate. Yes. OK. Yes. So, so, you, so you do the weigh. You do the way they come in, they they wash the access that's in their arm. They wash they have to wash. wash it off in the sink because you're going to uh, we call cannulate them mm, uh -huh. where we're inserting the needles in their arm. OK, so you want that area to be clean so that they won't get any infection. So it's, it's actually inside control. the body. The, yeah. the, the device is actually implanted inside of the body. That is correct. Okay, And so you have to clean the external parts for the. Uh, the, the needle to be inserted. That is correct. Okay. Okay. That is correct. Okay. I'm sorry. Keep going. No problem. This is this is really interesting. So you take them to their chair, and uh, the first thing you want to do after you have weighed them is you want to put in a uh, put their blood pressure cuff on. Okay. So that you can get their blood pressure. Okay. Because you that's something you have to monitor throughout the treatment is their blood pressure. Okay. And, and why why do you have to monitor blood pressure? during the treatment process? Because if a blood pressure goes too low, that could be chronic or too high. It could oh. be chronic because oh. you want them to be at a normal blood pressure, which is 120 over 80. Okay. Of course, you're not going to always have that. But when a blood pressure goes too low, the patient can uh, go out is what we call it in dialysis terms. Oh. They go out, which oh. means they can lose consciousness. Oh, really? And could, yes. So you have to monitor it so that you don't take, and if you take off too much fluid, their pressure can drop even lower. And is it a rapid drop? Sometimes it's a rapid drop. Sometimes it. And it, could that result in, in complications or even in some instances, could they possibly die if it's, if it goes too low? If it goes too low and you're not monitoring them, yes, they okay. could possibly okay. have. Uh, now, on the flip side, we talked about the low pressure. What about the high pressure? The high pressure, when your blood pressure is really high, there are chances for, yes, complications, stroke okay. or okay. heart attack. Okay. It, because, wow. you, you know, the silent yeah. killer. Sure. Okay. So you, you just explained. So it's very important that you monitor that blood pressure. Okay. So they're, they're sitting there, they're getting those, um, the treatment. And once does it, 
you click a button, press a button, and it just starts. Now, I got a quick question. You know, I, I know that the, the blood goes, comes out, yes. it's filtered. And where, how do you get it back in? Is there like a... There are two like, needles inserted. Oh, in the have, same location? Yes. Oh. They're, they're two inches apart from one another. Okay. And that's in, in the arm? In the arm. Okay. And, and they also have the treatment with the catheter too. Okay. Because when they're brand new patients, we start with the catheter. Okay. So, yes, they... Um, so, so the arm, we have them sit down. Okay. And then we... We have to use a tourniquet okay. so that we can feel for the veins. So that's that rubber thing? That blue rubber thing you tied around the okay. arm. Yes. You use the tourniquet to find the location. You also want to you always have a stethoscope because you want to listen for it to make sure that it's not uh, clogged up or anything. Oh, okay. Yes. So you want to make sure that you listen for it. So you can actually and feel it. Hear, hear, hear the blood going through or feel it going through? Yes, you can feel it pumping. You can feel the direction of the blood circulating through the through the actual access. Oh, okay. And you want to always listen okay. so that you can make sure that you're in the right spot because you can't just go in and start sticking people. Okay. You want to okay. always go to the so correct do location. Your prep, do your prep work. Yes, okay. you have to do your prep work. And how how, how fast does it go in? You know, when when you uh, you pumping it out and pumping it back in, if that's the correct term. How how quickly uh, does that move? It doesn't move fast. It it really depends on how much fluid you're removing. Mm -hmm. That lets you know how how fast. The fluid is removing. That's what you're you're talking about. Okay. So, so when the blood is is moving through the body and through the filtering system, how is the um, the fluid removed? What is there? Is that all in the same process? Yes, it is. The artificial kidney, which we call a dia uh, dialyzer, mm -hmm. it has really small uh, filters in it. So as the blood is being removed from the body, it's going through that dialyzer in okay. those little filters, and then those are catching all the particles and toxins. Oh, okay. And then as it comes back, it just goes down and comes back into the body clean. Okay. And as it's doing that, it's also removing fluid as okay. well. Okay. So we, we kind of discussed why people have dialysis, and it's basically to do the job that the kidney can't do. That is correct. Okay, great. When would someone have dialysis? How, how would they... No, uh, probably after their medical treatment, they've been diagnosed with kidney failure or kidney disease or whatever the case may be. They would, uh, the doctor would recommend or prescribe that they go on dialysis. That is correct. There are five stages of uh, chronic kidney failure. Okay. Stages one and two. Well, stages one and two. There is a possibility that you can regain full function of your kidneys. Really? Yes. If you follow the doctor's orders, you eat properly, take your medications, and make sure you go to the doctor on a regular basis. Okay. Um, stages four through five is, uh, three through five is when they start recommending dialysis treatment. But it has been known that even on dialysis treatment, after you have a couple of treatments, that your kidneys regain full function. Really? Yes. Because of the toxins, uh -huh. the toxins have been removed? Yes. And th not only that, that means that the patient is doing exactly what the doctor is telling them okay, to do. Okay. So if they're eating properly, maintaining their meds and following the doctor's orders, you could kind of reverse that. Absolutely. Wow. Is, is, so the damage to the kidney can be reversed or it just uh, does some things that it didn't do before? It does some things that it didn't do before. It, the kidneys actually kick back in to full function. But stages four and five, for the most part, no. Oh, okay. it, it, it can't be reversed. You have to go on dialysis, but you can't have uh, a long life on dialysis oh, okay. if you take care of yourself okay okay yeah okay if you're compliant and 
do what the doctors tell you to do. Listen to your technician because okay. your technician plays a big part. Okay. You're the, the social worker and the. Um, so it's a holistic it's approach a, to, to the treatment. Yes. Okay. Your dietitian, especially she gives you your renal diet. Yeah, follow yeah, that and follow listen it, okay. to it. And everybody's not compliant always. Okay. So. Well, you can mess up a little bit, but you got to stay as close to it as you can. Huh? Yeah. You you have to come to your dialysis okay. treatment. What is that big clunky machine called? The one I, I always see it where it looks like it's spinning or something. What it's, What is that called? It's just the dialysis machine. Oh, oh, really? oh okay. There's <laughs> no, 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 no fancy word for no it. No okay. fancy oh. words for it. Hey, I'm, just I'm a little smarter. Types. Smarter than I yes. thought. Huh? That's yes. what I've been calling it. And that machine has to be set up every morning before every dialysis treatment. So you can't. So if I used it and you used it in between that time, it has to be reset. It has or, to be reset. It has to be for each patient and wiped down. OK, absolutely. How do you clean it? How do they clean bleach water? Bleach water goes through the, no, the system. No, you actually clean you just clean the surface with bleach water to clean the machine because when you set it up you have what you call lines okay so each patient get their own lines oh okay because yes. I, I was a little worried about you know <laughs> charlie may have a little more than the kidney failure and he come hooking me up and now i get out and i'm worse off than when i sat in that chair right no it's a it's a whole setup okay dialyzer Great. your lines are all brand new, fresh out the pack. Okay, each time. great, great. Where do people go to get a uh, dialysis treatment? Well, some they come to the clinics. You have others that may be dialyzed at home. They may choose to do home hemodialysis. Really? You can do that at home? You can do it at home. Wow. Yes. Yeah, so they, is it like a portable system they bring in, or do the people actually have that system in their homes all the time? Or do, is it a combination of both? Well, it's a combination of both because you have your home hemodialysis, which is the actual big machine that's in the unit that some people have in their home. Really? And then you have what you call peritoneal dialysis, which is a small portable di dialysis machine that in its uh, your access is in your peritoneal cavity in within your stomach, oh, your abdomen. Okay. And those patients, they they can dialyze overnight. Oh, so and they can do it while they're sleeping. Yes. Oh, okay. It's, it's longer. It pulls the fluids at a slower pace. Okay. So that they can do it overnight. So and you can go to sleep, plug in, or for lack of a more sophisticated absolutely. term, and then in the morning, pop absolutely. it out, and you're good to go. Yes. Oh, okay. However, that one is more susceptible for infection. Oh. Okay, because you have to keep that area clean. You sure. have to keep your home clean, free of dust. Oh, wow. Because okay. you don't want to catch It don't sound as good as it did the first <laughs> it few seconds you mentioned. But a lot it. of people that work and travel, they they prefer to do that. Oh, okay. As opposed to sure. coming into the center and doing About how big is the unit? Um, about, no. Okay. No, what is that? About a foot wide, yes. foot long. Okay. So is it is it heavy? Big. No, it's oh, not okay. because it's actually portable. So it's, it's similar to maybe like a portable oxygen type setup. Absolutely. Okay. About, okay. How long is dialysis? How long is the treatment process? Or does it vary between uh, cases, case by case? It varies between case by case, and it can be anywhere from. I know we had one patient who ran two hours and forty five minutes where you have other patients that may run five hours. Five hours. So it really depends on how well they're being cleansed and how uh, their weight, because a small person may run from two, 40, two hours, 45 minutes to three hours, where a heavier person may have to run the full four hours okay. to so it four depends to five on hours. Body types and body lifestyle types. and things of that nature. Absolutely. Okay. What what's so the average the, the the shortest time is about two hours, and the yeah. longest time is about five, five hours. Absolutely, wow. the well, average time for most are three three hours. Three hours is average. Okay. Yes. What do they do while they're sitting? They sit in a chair. I'm assuming. They sit in a nice, comfortable chair. Okay. Where the um, 
you know, the legs come out, the back legs back. Oh, so like a recliner. You, yes, oh, a recliner. Like, so you guys have lazy boys in yes. that business. Okay. And they can watch TV. They have TV okay. at every station in the okay. unit. Okay, so you can watch, read, or just do whatever. But a you have to be stationary. You can't be. You can't get can't up. Walk. You can't move. If they have to go to the restroom, for those that still eliminate, then we do what we call a rinse back. So you return their blood. And you leave their needles in, but you tape them down so they can go to the restroom. Do they have to start the process all over again? Yes. Really? Yes. But you don't have to. You're not removing their needles. So they're okay. All you're doing is coming back, sit down, and we'll plug back oh. up the same setup that's already there. So the two-hour clock starts again. No, the two-hour clock doesn't start oh, okay. again. It just pauses. Oh, so, so it stops like where it – okay. Yeah, and then you just wow, re restart it. How often – this is Dallas treatment. Is it once a week, every day, four days a week? Does it vary? Or how do, is that determined? And, and what's the, if, if there is a norm, what is that? It varies, but the norm is three weeks. I mean, three, three times a week. Okay. So you would go either Monday, Wednesday, or Friday, mm -hmm. or you'll go Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Okay. Close on Sundays. Okay. <laughs> so they get a day off. Okay. But uh, yes, they have to go three times a week. There yeah. are some patients, very few, that run twice a that okay. runs twice a uh, okay. Okay. Well, somebody's trying week. to get I'm a hold sorry. of you. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Apologize for no, that. Okay. Okay. So the five hour person, they would have to sit fifteen hours a week. Absolutely. To, to get their to, treatment. To get their treatment. And the reason being is they're not they're not being cleansed very well at a lower time frame. Okay. So they might have started off at four hours, uh -huh. but they were sure. their their cleansing wasn't good enough. So they have to run that extra five, that extra hour. Okay. That makes sense. They're not happy at mm. first, but Kinda when they start to. seeing how well their blood is being cleansed, they learn they appreciate it. Can can you see a physical difference in some people when they begin and then they, they're doing all the right things. They're eating right. They're following the doctor's orders. They're taking their meds. And you see the, the fluid come off of them. Do you see a difference in in their appearance, their physical appearance, or even their stamina or the way they, they carry themselves? Yes, you can. You can tell the difference of those that are compliant and those, and those that are not. Sure. Because uh, they they even tell you they feel better. But each each treatment is a little different because depending on what they did when they weren't there the, sure. the day before. OK. But yes, physically, you can not see a difference in them. Weight loss, which is means they're there okay. doing the proper thing. And they're getting they're that getting water them. weight off of. Them. OK, great. And does exercise play a part in that as well? As well as the, the holistic, the whole quality of life thing where you got to eat right. Walk, do all the things that you need to do. Just as even if you didn't have dialysis, you have to do that as well. Exercise Probably more so then. More so okay. then, okay. yes. Okay, good. Big question: Is it painful? Does it hurt the process? It looks like it hurts. If you know, for somebody to take something out your body, take it around, put it in that dialysis machine, <laughs> right. go through the process, and then put it back in your body. That feels like it hurts. So can they feel it? As it like cold in the blood. I know sometimes when you get medication mm -hmm. for various things, it'll heat up your body or make your body cold. Is there any physical reaction that people have as far as pain or chills or coldness or heat, uh, overheating or anything like that? Actually, yes. Well, the most painful part is inserting the needles. Okay. Once you get past that, it's no longer painful. They can feel because there's a temperature gauge on the machine, uh -huh. so they can feel it going in as warm or cold, but they don't really get used to the insertion of the needles. The, the older patients don't. The younger patients, they do. It's okay for them, but the older patients say, I could never get used to this. It still hurts. Huh. So every time they come in for treatment, they have to insert a needle. And that's correct. Okay. Wow. Is there a, a age variance or have you seen it? What What's the youngest you've, you've seen in, in your career? 
the youngest in my career is 20 years old. 20? Yes. And that is because a lot of them, well, the ones that I know that were that young, they had lupus. Oh. They had some type of other illness okay, so that, that contributed, contributed to them. Okay, sure. Um, then you have those uh, that were hereditary, polycystic kidney disease. They had. Uh, so it's uh, they just inherited from their family. Yes. Okay. And then you have your older ones that. That. Due to the way they did things, drinking. Oh, kind of contributed to, to, to the, their okay. kidney failure. So there are some factors, and that goes back to the eating right and taking care of your body thing. So they basically have abused their yeah. body, and this is the result of the years of neglect or abuse to their bodies, their um, renal failure. That is correct. Okay. Drug, well, uh, street, you know, oh, drugs, drugs and, and all. Okay. Yes, and drinking. Uh, drinking plays a, a huge part. Sure. And not only that, when you take your ibuprofen and your over-the-counter medications, sure. that can contribute too because you you must take those on a, uh, after eating, sure. an hour before eating or uh, an hour after you take the medication, you might want to eat before or after you okay. take that medication okay, sure. because it really can damage your kidneys. Okay. And then there are other medications that you listen to on TV and people just take them because the doctors say, okay, take this medication. Sure. And they, they take it not knowing the side effects as a, or don't care what the side effects are. And a lot of those side effects do say, you know, if the you kick, have that uh, kidney disease. Yeah, kidney you have to disease. watch out for it. Okay. Yes. Oh, that's great. Great information. Is there a preparation process before one goes into actually having a dialysis session or sitting down in the chair? Is there something or some things that you recommend that people do prior to the actual process of going through the dialysis session? Doing that dialysis treatment? Yeah, on yeah right. Day? Yeah, before they go in. Do, do they prepare for it or is there some recommendations that they should should have? The only thing we recommend when they get, when they leave for the day, if they came in with fluid overload, I always recommend that they watch their fluids the day, the, the next day when they're not at dialysis. You always want to watch your fluids because what people, a lot of people don't understand is, it's not just water. Rice has a lot of fluids. Mm. Greens have fluid. Beans. These are so things that you do, cook do in you, water. So. so do you all have a recommendation of certain things that they should and should not eat? So that things that actually, you know, I wasn't thinking about rice. I wasn't thinking about beans or greens or things like that. When I'm thinking water, I'm thinking liquid and not, not necessarily food intake. So, do you recommend or you have a, a chart or is there some place they can go to get that information that says they be careful on the amount of this and that that you intake? Yes, they would see the dietitian. The dietitian will give them a renal uh, diet to follow. Okay. It lets them know what they can and cannot eat. Of course, they don't always follow that, but they do have that to reference to what they should and should not eat. Oh, Okay. Now, what's the difference between, you mentioned two things, and I want to go back to them. Uh, what is shunts? Did I call shunts? Or sh no, actually, yeah. shunts are used are not used in dialysis. They used to use them years ago. Okay. But those, you can catch infection oh, really, really quick with those because it's constantly it's sitting in your arm okay. all the time. So they got rid of that and they start using the accesses. The access. What, so have, what's what's the, the basic difference between a shunt and an access? The the shunt is really temporary. Okay. And it has to be changed out more often, whereas the access is your vein and artery connected together, and they don't have to take it out unless it's been damaged okay. because you can damage it if you're not cannulating properly. So you could possibly keep it in there forever if it hasn't been compromised. Absolutely. Okay. And we have have patients that have had the same ones since they've been on dialysis. And then you have those that had to have them replaced or moved to a different arm. 
or just a different location in the same arm due to the damage or, as you said, being compromised. Okay. As a technician, are you with the patient all while they're going through the dialysis treatment? Or are you in the general vicinity, you check one and go to another one and kind of rotate and keep checking on them to make sure that the blood pressure is correct, uh, certain levels are done are correct, as well as the operation of the machine. So you're in constant surveillance of, of your, your patient? Yes, you are. You have to monitor your patients and you can have anywhere from four to five patients at a time. Okay. So you have to monitor, like you said, their blood pressure and the machine lets you know everything. It lets you know their blood pressure. It automatically takes their blood pressure every half an hour. Okay, does it deal with the heart rate and things of that nature? Absolutely. As well? okay. it, it tells you their heart rate, their blood pressure, how well they're, how well they're being cleansed. Okay. And it will alarm you if anything seems out of place. If air gets into the line, that's a no no. You definitely don't want air getting into the okay. line. Because it can, but the machine will alert you. The machine will alert you that there's air in the line, and it will cut it off. It or does will. it stop it before it gets and goes back into the body? It automatically shuts off. It stops. The machine will stop moving. Oh, really? Yep. Yeah, it'll alarm you. And do you have to? Is there a process or something you you as a technician have to do to get that air out of the line, or does the machine do that for you? No, that's one thing the machine doesn't do. Oh. It'll let you know, but it will not remove the air. As a technician, you will have to remove the air yourself. And it's a long process. It could be, depending on how much air it was, you can actually remove it using a syringe. Okay. Oh. If it's not that much, I mean, if it's a lot of air in the line, then you would just tear the whole setup down and restart the patient. Oh, wow. Okay, so that's again. a cumbersome process. Yes, it is, but it's for the patient's safety. Okay. Quality of life. After people that are going through that treatment, how's their quality of life? Can they pretty much do everything they want to do or everything they have historically done prior to going on dialysis? And now we're talking about those patients that do the diet and follow the doctor's orders and take their meds and, and consistent consistently. Are they able to pretty much live a, a good quality life or maintain that quality of life that they did prior to dialysis? Yes, they are. If they are compliant to the doctor's orders, following their diet, coming to their treatment, which is number one and most important that they do come to their treatments on a regular basis, try not to have fluid overload. Mm -hmm. We had a patient there that was 90, 90 years old and been, had been on dialysis for 20 some odd years. Oh, wow. She travels, she lives in, she resides in Arizona and during the summer months, she comes here. Oh, she's snowbird, snow huh? Yes. Okay. <laughs> right. And she's, she's doing well. So they can still travel. They can take trips because they have dialysis technicians on the boats. So they can still take their cruises. Oh, okay. And they just have to let you know when they want to travel so that the center can call a center to the location where they're going to be traveling to so they can still get their treatment. Okay. So they don't have to stop doing those things that they're doing unless it's going to be harmful to their bodies. Okay, great. Nurses, nurses involvement. I know the technicians have to be under the guidance of a nurse or have to work in conjunction with the nurse. What is the nurse's function as it relates to dealing with folks that are on dialysis or even dealing with the dialysis tech? The nurses, because the dialysis tech uh, operates under the nurse's license, the nurses... They, oh, they un operate under the nurse's license. Absolutely. Okay. Wow. Without that nurse there, you can't even administer the treatment. Really? There has to be an RN okay. present. That's interesting. And the nurses, because they have to pass medications, uh, like heparin, that blood thinner for okay. those that clot sure. off a lot, then they have to That's give. That's the thing them. they shoot in your stomach a lot. Um, no, or they actually shoot they right in the IV. Yes. Oh, okay. Or through the line, right before you connect the patient to the line okay. to the machine, they might administer it then, or they can come by later and 
put it in the IV. Okay. So the nurse plays a pivotal role, pivotal role in the whole dialysis process or the dialysis experience. They absolutely do because if, as I mentioned before, if a patient's blood pressure is low, there are many things you have to monitor because if a patient is blood pressure is low and you let their feet down during a dialysis treatment, that's when they can go out. Okay. So yeah. if that happens, you need that nurse because that nurse will have to give them oxygen. Sure. And though the technician can give them a certain amount of oxygen, when it goes to a different level, the nurse has to minister because okay. that is a medication and the nurse has to administer that oxygen okay. as well. Okay, That's great. Education wise, how, how, what, what educational background do you have? How did you become a dialysis tech and what type of uh, education or what type of training that you had to become a tech? Well, I went to a technical school and there was an eight week class oh, okay. for the uh, technician. You have your book knowledge that you have to, of course, study the course. Sure. And then you have the your lab portion of it, teaching you how to cannulate, teaching you how to set up the machines okay. and what to look out for. Did, did you all work on real people? You can't. That's something you can't work on. Oh, OK. Uh, it's always a dummy arm. Oh, OK. But they set it up like a real arm in it. To be honest with you, it's really totally different. It's not the same. Okay. Because when you dealing with a human, you like a little bit nervous. I can imagine. For your first time in cannulating. Then, then you kind of get so used to it. Absolutely. Yeah, I was a little, that was a question that was in the back of my mind. I'm like, okay, do you work on real people? So when you get to <laughs> actually do it, you know, you're sticking a needle in the wrong place and yeah, poking around and things. But you once you get the, the, the hang of it, you can really with the flow of it absolutely because there are different gauge needles that you use okay. on the patients because when they're a brand new patient you want to use a smaller ne smaller needle okay. a smaller gauge needle as opposed to once their arm and their axis develops which takes six to eight weeks depending on the type of access they have then you'll go to the larger okay. gauge needles okay was there any type of um state board or exam that you have to take to be uh, certified? Yes, there is. However, you have to work as a dialysis technician for 18 months before you can even take the certification. Oh, really? Because it takes that long just to learn. Uh, and it's a state certification. It's a state board certification. Wow. There are two. There is one, um, the bonnet, and then you have the CCHT. And the difference is one is good for four years and you can take that anywhere uh, to different state from state oh, to state. Oh, okay. That's whereas great. the other one, the CCHT is three years, but you can only use it in the state that you took the uh, oh, really? certification. Wow. That's interesting. So you go through the, the class, both the, uh, the book and the practical, and then you go out into the field. And then after 18 months of successfully doing what you're doing, you have the opportunity to apply for for certification. That is correct. Okay, great. That is wonderful information to have because, you know, young folks need some options. And that sounds like something a lot of young folks could get into. And, and I know that we talk about that being a uh, increasingly large occupational uh, area now. A lot of folks are on dialysis. So the more folks that are on dialysis creates the bigger job and the bigger market, market uh, request for Dialysis Tech. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being here. You wanted to say something? Else? Yes, I did. I, I just want to say for those that are looking to become a dialysis tech, just make sure you're compassionate about it okay. uh, because we get to go home and do normal and live normal lives. Sure. These dialysis patients are not just dialysis patients. They're cancer patients. Okay. They have other Health, health issues. issues. Okay. They're anemic because you're you're they lose blood sometimes during dialysis because you know you're 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 removing blood from them and sure. you're returning their blood to them at the end of the treatment. However, if a patient when you pull his, their needle, if they bleed, they they lost, they blood. lost blood. So they're always cold all the time. So okay. just be compassionate about it. Don't go into it for the money. I mean, 
the money is okay, but at the same time, just have a compassion for people okay. and a love for taking, wanting to take care of someone else. Because if you could just, if you can get them one patient to follow the doctor's orders by something that you've encouraged them about, okay. then you've done your job. And a lot of them are depressed. A lot of them are I'm in sure denial they because they're in there and then they have to be on a transplant list for years. Really? Yes. I know. Yeah, patients we didn't, that we didn't even talk about that. Transplant list for years, unless they have a family member that's willing to give them a kidney. What, what are there yeah, precursors or pre um, prerequisites for getting on a transplant list? How does one get on a transplant list and what exactly is a transplant list? The, they get on the transplant list. They talk to the social worker at the unit. Mm -hmm. the, actually, the social worker will come around and ask them that they want to get on the transplant list. Okay. Then she'll let them know everything that they need to do to get on the list. And that is they have to come. To, they can't miss treatments. Okay. Because they're thinking, okay, if you're missing treatments and we give you this kidney, are you going to take care of it? Right. You're wasting something that could go to someone who is going to be more appreciative of it. Absolutely. Okay, great. And they can get on more than one list. However, when they call you and say your name came up, you have a certain amount of time to go and be at that location. Oh, okay. And some of the people are on the list in Wisconsin. Some are on a list here. So... Imagine if I'm on a list in Wisconsin and my name comes up and they say, hey, you have to be here. You're getting on 94 and heading on out. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I'm because you, if not, if you don't show up when they tell you to, you then, will have to wait. You have to go back oh, to the back to bottom, the of, the bottom of the list. Absolutely. Wow. I think I would be one that hey, I'd have three or four phones and pagers and yes. email and Facebook and all, all that other stuff. They, they'd find me and I'd find them. Yeah. And they have to go for constant blood work too. Okay. Yeah. They have appointments at those centers, the hospitals okay. where their name is on the list and they have to go for their uh, monthly blood work and things like that. Okay. Great. So we learned a, a lot of things. We learned about dry weight, blood pressure being a key factor in dialysis for those who are receiving treatment, eating healthy, taking your meds, following the doctor's orders, uh, exercise regimen, nothing as strenuous, but something to keep you moving and flowing. But from a diet dialysis tech standpoint, I think one of the key words you mentioned was have compassion. These yeah. are human beings that are going through some things that are on transplant list. They're also on uh, that. Some, some cases they're depressed. In some cases they have some other medical issues that are contributing or are a result of, the dialysis. So thank you. Thank you for this. some great information. We would greatly appreciate it. So we're going to wrap this up and we thank Penelope Thomas, Di Dialysis Tech, for being here with us, giving us this great information. And as always on Common Talk and Intellectual Radio as a whole, we come to inform you. So thank you. We're going to do this again next week. I'm your host, Jay Jack. You've been in tune to Common Talk here on IntellectualRadio.com. We are out. Thank you.